Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome back to my channel where I talk about my journey to sustainable health and meaningful success. If you're coming back and you've already subscribed, welcome back. Y'all are my people and I love you so much. And if you're new, I hope you consider subscribing by the end of this video. I promised that I was going to be reacting to Larry Winters audio, Call Me Fanatical. Larry Winters and his wife Pam um, are the founders of Leadership Team Development, which is the like subgroup of Amway that I was a part of. So they would record their own audios and sell books and the audio recordings and then charge $90 a month for their subscription fees just so that you can have access to that. They would host their own conferences, which were Amway conferences, but also LTD conferences. So um, yeah, I was hesitant to react to anything from Larry and Pam because I thought that they were just such sweet people um, you know, they just had the heart of God within them or whatever I thought. And, uh, listening to this audio, I realized that, um, there are very subtle ways that they would manipulate people into staying in and continuing to buy into all of the brainwashing and everything. Um, if you haven't heard my story yet, I would encourage you to check out, uh, some of my earlier Amway videos that cover what actually happened when I was in Amway and my experience with that because it was very cult-like. I lost a lot of money, uh, a lot of friends, and um, it really sent me into a spiral uh, because of the toxic relationships within that and the toxic culture of Amway LTD. So without further ado, let's get into Call Me Fanatical. It's an hour and three minutes, so I'm going to try to break it up into two parts. Hopefully, It'll be a two-part rather than a three-part series on my channel. Um, I'm going to listen to it on 1.25 speed, and you might even be inspired to speed him up even more. And I'll be putting on makeup uh, while I do this because I want something to do while I'm listening to this guy. Um, also, if my hairline looks a little bit fuller than normal, I got my hair done. But my girl, Megan, we talk about her a lot because apparently I'm obsessed with my hair. And, uh, yeah, so the, the dye kind of stained my scalp. So you're welcome for my appearing to be full head of hair. Anyway, weird. Let's just get into it. What I want to do is I want to share with y'all a talk from my heart to you. We're Larry and Pam Winters from Raleigh, North Carolina. We build a business at a double diamond level. And our life is absolutely so blessed, and we are so thankful for this opportunity. We've used the Amway business and the Amway vehicle to get where we're at. We use the LTD education system to support everything that we do. And I just have to tell you that I am fired up about our business. I heard it. Okay, we're stopping it already here. Um, because he gives credit to Amway being what... It has provided all of the wonderful wealth of his lifestyle, but um, that LTD has supported everything that they did through like audios and books and stuff. So LTD is a support, a support to their income, but that's not true. And they never allude really at any point throughout any of the audios. I had never heard that the speakers in LTD actually do take a salary from that or do take um, income from the speeches that they give for Amway LTD and for you know all of the different audios that they sell on LTD so um, what I found out after the fact was and this was from someone who had also quit so I guess I have to say allegedly because I don't have proof of income because they don't give that kind of proof of income um, but Amway really only is probably like half, if not less than half of a total income from someone who is high up in Amway LTD. So my upline, sorry, I'm fighting a sneeze. This is a theme for this whole fall. It's just going to happen. I'm allergic to like everything. Anyway, um, so my upline platinums they would always give credit to like, oh, you know, we make 
like however much money in Amway or where we were able to re retire off of our Amway income and like we're just so thankful for LTD for um, you know providing this support providing this um, network that we can be like-minded and have this kind of support and mentorship and blah 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 but in reality it was like half of my Upline Platinum's income was from LTD and the audios that they sold from from the audios that they were recording in LTD. So this is just something that's like kind of shasty right off the bat because they don't give, they don't actually say that they make their income from like half Amway and half LTD. They're like, oh, we're just so thankful for Amway for providing this income and they don't even... They don't even really um, acknowledge that LTD is where they get half of their income. Shiesty. An audio when I was about 100 PV, maybe 1,000 PV, on audio way back. It was a cassette tape. That audio changed me. That audio blessed me. The audio was called Call Me Fanatical. And I know most of you haven't heard it, but I did. And I'm not going to do that talk. But I'm going to tell you this, that because I heard that talk and I became fanatical since that moment till today, you can still call me fanatical. And I'm proud to be a fanatic. I'm proud to be fanatical. I'm proud to be all in. That's today's catchphrase. I'm proud to be sold out. I'm proud to, to, to tell people that this thing is one of the most important things in our life. My wife is extremely important. Our children are extremely important. Our grandkids are extremely important. But I'll tell you what, so is our business. Because of what this thing has done for us, done for our families, our extended families, families we don't even know, this is awesome. And so I'm going to give you some examples of being fanatical. And most of these were way back when. Again, I might have to turn this way to read because the notes are hard to read, but here's how I used to answer the phone back in this little 900 square foot house. Little tiny five room house, wood frame. There were only six windows in the whole house. The living room was like 10 by 12. It was a tiny little rental unit in South Raleigh on a quarter acre of land. And this place was basic at best. But when the phone rang, there were no cell phones or we didn't have any. When the phone rang, here's how I answered the phone. 8 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the morning, the phone would ring. Bling, bling, Diamond Headquarters, we doze but we never close. How many orders would you like to place? Every time. Because I read in a book, which was part of the system that my upline recommended to me. I read in a book that was part of the system my upline recommended to me. They do everything with enthusiasm. Charlie Tremendous Jones, Life is Tremendous. The book cost me $1.99. And in the book, he said, whatever you do, you need to do it enthusiastically. I read in a Les Giblin book, Be Excited. I read in a, a Glenn Bland book, Be Excited. And so, and, and I don't know who I heard it from. might have been Zig Ziglar. But he said, when you answer the phone, be excited. So I would answer the phone, Diamond Headquarters, we doze but we never close. How many orders would you like to place? Okay, just want to point out a couple things with that. Number one, um, he mentions like, oh, we'll answer the phone 8 a.m., 8 p.m., 2 p.m., 2 a.m. And uh, I know that that's just a subtle mention of that, but I have brought attention to this in recent um, audios, and I just want to do it again, that um, there is a culture that 2 a.m. phone calls, staying up until 2 a.m., Doing things for your business is a very normal thing within Amway LTD. That's almost expected if you're going to succeed in the business that you're going to be spending long hours doing everything that you need to do for the business. So like now, if I were to call you at 2 a.m., you'd be like, oh my gosh, what's the emergency? Why are you calling me at this ungodly hour? But yeah, that's just a normal thing. If someone calls at 2 a.m., Diamond Headquarters, we doze, but we never close. Okay, yeah. So just wanted to mention that. Also, um, just kind of pre-framing everything that he's saying with regards to positivity, excitement, all of these things that he's like naming and claiming, he's manifesting. And a lot of this audio, I'm just going to state this so I don't have to repeat it throughout. 
a lot of this audio is like, in general motivational terms, useful because you could hear the same thing at a Tony Robbins conference or, um, you know, basically any motivational speaker would say that you have to believe in your dreams. You have to believe that you're going to accomplish your goal before you actually accomplish it because you have to see it before you can achieve it. All of that. That's a normal thing for someone motivationally to say. However, Unfortunately, within Amway LTD, it's used with a much more, I don't know, deviant or much more sinister way of manipulating people because you get into that mode where you're, you know, saying your affirmations five times a day. You're doing all of the things that you need to do, but you're doing it happy, like happily. And you're, you're showing up to the conferences or to the environments and when people ask you how you're doing, even if you're really tired and run down and just super discouraged, you say, I'm wide awake and feeling great. Or, you know, I'm, I'm, my business is growing and everything is just fantastic. And so you are basically in a constant state of denial of your actual reality. And it's all in the name of being positive and all in the name of speaking what you want into existence. So I just want to point that out because throughout this entire audio, there's there's certain things that like, yes, at its most basic principle, that is a success principle that you can hear commonly. But how it's used in Amway LTD is basically a method of, of brainwashing and um, manipulation. And it's really tough to get someone out of that state because even if they are physically, financially, like just in every aspect of their lives suffering if they're constantly in that headspace where if I'm just positive and if I just smile and if I just, you know, act like I'm doing well, if I fake it until I make it, then eventually I'll make it. And and that's where a lot of people get tripped up in the business. And that's that's why a lot of people stay a lot longer than they actually would normally stay in something because of that um, constant mental rehearsal of of positivity. Hey. And, and we go, Larry, it's your mom. Oh, hey, mom, how you doing? I didn't care. Did my mom and dad th think we were fanatical? You better believe it. Did we did we miss family gatherings because of a conference that I wasn't in control of, but it was important to go to? Yeah. And when they said, you're not going to be at your sister's uh, uh, 15th birthday party or 20th birthday party, mom, she's at 20 stinking birthdays. It'll be okay if I miss this one. Well, you're messing up the family. You know, we want to, I got a conference. You don't have to go to that. Yes, I do. Because see, they couldn't see my business. There was no brick. There was no mortar. There were no walls. There were no trucks. There were no inventory. It was just abstract, okay? But I could see my business. Again, with the whole missing family events and missing family outings and just missing out on quality time with your family in order to go to a conference, um, there have been people who have missed weddings, who've missed funerals, births, birthdays, family reunions in order to go to conferences. Um, and it's, it's really devastating because like we talked about in my last video about um, knowing when to cut your losses, Unfortunately, um, there's like 99, over 99% of people in MLMs don't make any money, any money from their business. And so to like for the one person who missed a bunch of family vacations and is now able to take their family to, you know, God knows where um, and travel the world with them. There's 99 other families who just missed out on their on their person until until the person got hip to reality, like until the person actually like came around and said, no, you're right. I, I just, I missed all that time with you. I mean, we've talked about Scott Johnson who runs that radio show. Um, and I was on there for an interview and, um, you know, his story is that he spent the first 12 years of his son's lives in Amway. I mean, he missed the formative years of his son's growing up because he spent all of that time pursuing the Amway dream. And, Unfortunately, he's he his story is like most of our stories. Um, and in the video that I did about managing your expectations, thinking that your family is just going to forget about all of the times that you blew them off um, 
because of a conference because eventually you're going to achieve some sort of success and then be able to buy them a house and pay all of their bills and everything and they're, ju they're just going to forget about all the times you blew them off. That's just not how it happens in reality. And unfortunately, a lot of relationships are destroyed with this mentality that, you know, oh, she's had 20 other birthdays or, you know, all of that. It's just their priorities are so way off. And it's it's really unfortunate how many people's lives and families have been torn apart by Amway, LTD, by all of the other groups like LTD, like Worldwide Group, Worldwide Dream Builders, all of those everybody that preaches that mentality that Amway conferences come first, come before your family, come before your health, and all of that, it's just, it's really devastating. Yes, that's, and they didn't understand. So my whole family was mad at me all the way to Diamond. Didn't care. But I answered the phone, Diamond headquarters. Sometimes I still do. Usually today when I see who it's calling, if it's Brandon, Diamond Brandon West, how's it going, my friend? Diamond John Resch, how's it going, my friend? Diamond Byron Matthews, how is it going, my friend? Diamond, I even say to Ricky Winters, but Ricky will walk in, hey, Diamond, how's it going? Ricky will call me, like, never. But when he does, hey, Diamond Ricky Winters, how's it going? You can call me fanatical, I have no problem with that. People walk into my house, or they call me, or they see me, and they say, what's up? I'm 100 PV, I'm 1,000 PV. What's up? PV sponsored income, that's what's up. That's my answer. Every single time. And when I ask you what's up, if you're in my inner circle, and you don't say, if I ask Stephen, hey, Stephen, what's up? And he goes, uh, you know, good things, Dad, good things. That's not the right answer, Stephen. The answer is PV-sponsored income. Okay. Uh, what's up, Stephen? PV-sponsored income. Good man. Good job. Seriously, you're that fanatical? You bet. You can call me fanatical all day long. I got no problem with that. Because I want to speak what I want. I want to program myself. I want to program my people. And I want to confess what I want at all times. And every time you ask me what's up, it's an opportunity for me to speak into existence what I want. By the way, does anybody think the PV sponsored incomes up on the LTD team? I didn't start saying it in January. I've been saying it since 1980. Little tip there. How fanatical were we? We lived in that little tiny house. We got a dog. I don't remember we bought it. Somebody gave it to us. If it was rescue. I don't remember how we got the dog. But I remember naming the dog. The dog's name was PV. That is a gospel fact. And we couldn't walk our dog late in the afternoon and evenings because the neighborhood was too dangerous. But on the, on, the, on the good days that we could get outside and walk the dog, the neighbor, hey, that's a cute little dog. What's his name? PV. PV. What does that mean? Let me show you. It's easier to show you than tell you. We named our dog PV. We were told to put pictures on our refrigerator, put pictures on our TV. We did. We were told to write your goals all over the house on the bathroom mirrors. We did. And not only did I write goals on my house, but Danny Snipes, one of my personal frontline legs, who is now a diamond, Danny Renata Snipes, at the time they were newbies, they were living in Nightdale, North Carolina, and we were doing house meetings. We were told if you're going to do one house meeting, do at least seven, whether anybody shows up or not, do seven meetings. And so I was in Danny's house seven, eight, nine times doing meetings, and I had written freedom on my refrigerator. So I got to Danny's house after about three meetings. I'd already told him, put some dreams up, put some goals up, surround yourself, or you're not going to make it. So about the fourth time I got to his house, I didn't see a thing on his fridge. Not a picture, not a note, not a goal, not an index card, nothing. So I just thought I would help him out. I was going to help him set a goal, set a dream, and move him forward. And I picked up a marker, and I wrote freedom real big, like this big, freedom across the front of the refrigerator. You know, F, big, so you can see, don't do anything little. I was fanatical. I wrote freedom real big. In magic marker. Not erasable marker. Not. In er I thought it was one of the markers that was for the whiteboard. It erased real easy. I wrote on a refrigerator in black magic marker freedom. When Danny and Renata moved, they had the hardest time trying to sell that refrigerator. He was scrubbing on that thing for about four years, trying to get that off. And even when he got it off, you could still look and see embedded in the white freedom. Guess what? Danny's free. How cool was that? It all worked out. We were doing the plan the old way. We were throwing them up on the wall to see what sticks, and we were begging and selling, and we had no results. Gary Newell taught us the quality interview, the QI philosophy, the QI system, taught it to me. And all of a sudden, man, this thing started to work. I mean, like, overnight. It was like, bam! We started having guests. We started growing, 
And Mike Bundy sponsored a guy named Robert Colgan. Robert Colgan got in. He worked at Northern Telecom. That's a defunct IT company. But we did a plan at Robert Colgan's house, and we had like six people show up in a little tiny house. And then the next week we did a plan, and there was like 12 guests show up. I mean, this thing was going nuts. And, and, and all the IBOs, we had about five or six IBOs with about 10 or 12 guests there. They didn't fit in the living room. It was a little house. And so they all stood in the kitchen. I did the plan for all the guests. All the IBOs were in the kitchen just trying to listen. And so when the meeting was over, Robert said, I said, we're not going to have a meeting here next week, Robert. It's too small. And, and, and he said, no, no, I want another meeting here. This is going good. Most of these guests were mine. I had about four lights in the room. He had a couple lights in the room. And I'm like, we're just not going to fit. There's no room. I said, we're going to have to go somewhere else to a bigger house or something. And he said, no, no, I have an idea. So what's that? He said, let's tear this wall down right here. I said, what are you talking about? He said, it's not a load-bearing wall. It's just sheetrock. I'm pretty good with a hammer and some nails. He said, let's, I said, you're crazy. He said, no, it'll just, it'll open this whole thing up. So he literally goes out in the garage. He comes back with a claw hammer and he starts taking the sheetrock down. So I'm, I'm helping. I'm pulling sheetrock off. We get to the two by fours. He gets out a little saw, cuts the two by. He's got this big archway, about, you know, got an archway about four feet wide. And now we can put people there. We can put people here. The next week we did the plan. The place was packed out. That opening was money. And we never did another plan there. We did one plan with a hole in the wall. We grew so fast, we never went back to Robert's house. He used to say, can we do another meeting in my house? I'm going to get a new lake store. I said, do it yourself. Do the plan yourself. You're capable. So what's funny is we tore a hole in the guy's wall for one meeting. How funny is that? Just wanted to point out, Robert Colgan is what he uh, just, the guy's name was, that they had that meeting at their house and it was exploding for them. And Robert Colgan is in a diamond on on. LTD's team. I mean, I don't know anything about Robert Colgan, but he just told a, uh, an anecdotal story about a meeting that was blowing up. You know, they had tons of guests and, you know, they outgrew the space. But where is Robert Colgan? That's where I'd like to know what I'd like to know, because I don't see him on any stage giving any motivational talks. And it seems like maybe Robert was uh, yet again, somebody who maybe did some things in the business, maybe had, you know, grown their business to a certain size, but it wasn't sustainable and it eventually just faded away and, and the guy probably quit. I mean, that's just, I'm not saying anything for sure, but I, that's what I would assume happened because it's not like we're see, we're hearing from Robert Colgan today. And that's probably, I mean, you want an anecdotal story that's actually representative of the majority? That's Robert Colgan for you. Here's how fanatical I was. My boy started racing dirt bikes. Steven was older by two years. I think he was 10 when we started racing. They started riding when they were six and four. Well, they started racing when they were 10 and eight, I think, or eight and six, I don't remember. But Steve, Steven's number was number 12. Because it took 12 platinum legs to be a double diamond. Ricky's number was 14. Because if you had 14 FAA points, you could be a double diamond. My goal, they were, we were already diamonds when they started racing. My goal was to be a double. My goal was to be EDC and double when they started racing. When I had a dirt bike, I, I, I sold them all. I got married and, and I didn't have a dirt bike. When I have a Ruby, I bought a dirt bike. I raced as a Ruby. I raced with Mike Bundy as a Ruby on my Honda 125. My number on my jersey, my number on my bike was number nine for EDC. Stevens was number 12 for 12 platinum legs. Ricky was 14 for 14 FAA points. Every single thing I did was based on, for, and around this business. No, not this business. Around my business. Everything. Say, man, you were obsessed. Yes. Man, you were fanatical. Yes. You can call me fanatical, and I love it. I'm proud to be fanatical. I see other people going to sporting events and they'll take off their shirts, they'll pen a, a D-U-K, go to a Cameron Crazy game and see what them kids will do. It's insane. But then they get in this and they go, oh, I'm, just, I'm not too dignified for that. And you're a Cameron Crazy. You're in Ohio State. You're white and red. You've got O-H-I-O painted on your chest and it's 19 degrees. Well, they don't know because they're so liquored up they can't tell. You can call me fanatical, baby. I have no problem with that. Boys were numbered after goals that I had. We started out with success. I bought a Lexus SC400. 
brand new 1992. We went diamond 91 1992. I bought a brand new Lexus SC 400 sports coupe. Awesome car. Back in the day, Lexus were cool. Now, you know, every dentist has one. Okay. But I had, I had a Lexus before anybody, you know, you couldn't afford them. And you know what my license plate said? No job. N-O space J-O-B. Fanatical. No job. I bought a Ferrari in 1995. I was still fanatical. I bought a Ferrari. Guess what my license plate said? Amway Dollars. And I didn't even have anywhere to go because I had no job. I just used to just drive around in my Ferrari letting people see. I'd get in traffic on purpose and just get in front of people. It wasn't hard getting in front of them, by the way. And I would go real slow. And they'd have to look at Amway Dollars on that Ferrari. I used to roll the window down and give people thumbs up behind me. It's fanatical, baby. I'm telling you. Proud of it. I used to leave the car dealership when I sold cars. Sometimes we had to work at, till 8 o'clock at night. That's when the dealership used to close. And some nights we got off at 4, some nights we got off at 7, 8. And I was always in my suit of clothes. I went upstairs and changed. I'd freshen up. And I had a house meeting at 8.15 in Garner. I'd leave. I'd leave Raleigh. I'd drive. I'd get to that house meeting at 8.15. I'd be in my blue suit, white shirt, red tie. I'd been at the car dealership for 8, 10, 12 hours that day. But here's how I left the car dealership. Every single day I left the car dealership. Whether I left at 4 in the afternoon, 6 at night, 8 at night, didn't matter if the place was packed or empty. I would get up from my desk. I was already changed. I would change before it was 8 o'clock, so at 8 o'clock I could bolt. And then I'd walk over those double doors right out to the carport where my little Volkswagen Rabbit was sitting. I would call my little Volkswagen demo that I, I was supposed to drive around and show people, and then they want to buy one. Was I fanatic? But yeah, I'd walk out the door. I'd hit them double doors, and I, would throw, I wouldn't just go through them. I would, I would, I would throw them open. I would throw the doors open so they would open real wide. And I would get right outside them, and I would just stand under that carport. And I would go, FREEDOM! Get my little Volkswagen wrap and go show the plan. I'd stand there and yell freedom at the top of my lungs every single day I left that death trap of viewership. You can call me fanatical. All right, just want to recap all of his examples. I've written all of those down. Um, that all of the things that was fanatical that he basically centered his life around. Every single person that you meet uh, or just every single person that you encounter in the business, no matter how long you've known them, it's Hey Diamond. So you call each other Diamond, which is handy if you forget someone's name because you can just call them Diamond. Um, if it's if someone asks you how you're doing, it's or what's up. PV sponsoring an income. That's what's up. Um, naming the dog PV. <laughs> Uh, writing freedom on the refrigerator, making dream boards, um, numbering the dirt bikes after Amway goals that he had, um, no job, license plate, and then um, yelling freedom at the top of his lungs after the after he got out of the dealership. These are all the things that basically that's the recipe for making your life all about Amway, for making your life completely obsessed over Amway. Um, and I mean, none of those things are harmful. Um, I guess if you were to do any sort of, or have any sort of goal, you would have similar things around. I, in fact, if you follow me on Instagram, which is linked down below, I, I'm not really serious about growing my followers there, but if you want to follow me, you can. Um, I posted my pictures that I just recently put up all around my apartment that kind of remind me of my goals, um, for my health journey. And so, like, those kinds of things, yeah, they they do help. Um, but that that's he's actually painting a pretty accurate picture of how Amway people live in complete obsession and consumption in, in Amway. That, like, they're completely consumed with Amway. And everything that they do in their lives is centered around Amway. It's, it's pretty fanatical. It is pretty fanatical. And... There, a lot of people are like that. Um, of course, as we've said about a thousand times before, um, only less than 1% of those fanatical people actually ever make success, but they're all fanatics. No fanatical is? Having to leave the car dealership because they were make me work on a conference weekend. No, 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 no. I told you I don't work on conference weekends. I only want every three months. I'll work every other Saturday if I have to, but I'm not working on conference weekends. Well, one of our guys is out sick and you need to fill in for him. No, you fill in for him. I'm going to the conference. 
Larry, if you don't go to conference, you're going to get fired. I said, I'm not getting fired. Here's my keys. Have a nice day. Now, the, 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 the challenge with this was the only car I owned was, was not mine. It was the car dealerships of the Volkswagen Rabbit. It was a demo. And so I couldn't take the car home. They wanted it back. Greedy little jokers. I gave them the give or talk. They didn't buy it. So Danny Snipes gave me a ride back to Brighton Road. Dropped me off. I had no car. Well, what's funny is Danny took the Volkswagen back and they had to walk around and they had to check it back into inventory. Now they're going to sell it because the demo's over. The salesman's not using it anymore. And so Danny's dad goes, Danny! What the heck? It's on the PA. Danny Snipes, come to, uh, come to the uh, carport right now. Come to the service area right now. Danny Snipes. Danny gets it. What's wrong, Dad? Did you, did you see this? What? This is a demo. He's only worked here 17 months. There's 51,000 miles on the odometer. There's 51,000 miles on the odometer. You're supposed to drive 20 miles a day at the most. He's only worked here. He only sold six cars. This thing's a total loss. How did he put 51,000 miles? How far does he live? Danny goes, he's got a quite a commute, Dad. I'll just tell you that. He's got quite a commute. I lived a mile and a half from the dealership. A mile and a half. Call me fanatical. Just wanted to bring attention to the fact that he quit his job in order to go to a conference. So not only do family relationships and the people that are important to you in your life or supposed to be important to you in your life um, have to miss out on on you because of your obsession with going to conferences, but you'll also that people will also quit their jobs and put their livelihoods at stake and, and in effect their families at stake because they would rather go to an Amway conference than uh, you know, to provide for their families with their job, their J O B. You can call me fanatical. In 1985, it was the worst year of our life in many ways. Terry getting diagnosed with spinal meningitis, no health insurance, in and out of the hospital about 21 days. Hospital bills skyrocketing. Uh, I'm in between jobs. I'm selling secondhand sweaters at a trunk of pants. Mom and dad's uh, a, a beat up old Mustang that they lent us. It was totaled twice, two times the total wreck. It couldn't even get insured or titled. Her dad got it registered as a fishing mobile for the coast of North Carolina. And I'm riding around in this Mustang that's all totaled up. The chassis is bent. It only got 3,000 miles out of a tire, wear a tire, uh, because it was all jacked up. And, and, and so, and so 1985 was a bad year. 1985, my wife was in a dumpster passing out aluminum cans to me so we could get $64 and go to a conference. We bought our conference tickets by collecting aluminum cans. When we found out there was a golf tournament in Raleigh, we said, man, if there's golf, if there's beer cans, if there's beer cans, there's aluminum, if there's aluminum, we can go get our conference tickets in one day. We'll go empty that, we'll go empty that stinking dumpster, turn that into Alcoa, and we've got our conference tickets. We won't have to drive around all night. We won't have to go over to the Long Branch and get it at. We won't have to go down to, and, and then look in, in South Raleigh for cans along the road. Man, it's going to be easy, simple, quick, and Man, beneficial. It was August. My, we were getting ready for FED Summit. My wife's in a dumpster in 95 degree weather. Pass the little cans out to me, time on the roof of mom and, her mom and dad's total car. In 1985, my total income was less than $10,000 for the year for a family of three, Larry, Pam, and Tara. Less than ten. Okay. Just want to point out the fact that this is this is someone who actually does have an anecdotal story of success, but he had his wife in a dumpster collecting aluminum cans and 95 degree weather. It, that is the amount of extreme that you have to go to. And I know here's the thing. If I'm if there's someone who is actually currently in Amway watching this video right now, that concept doesn't seem weird to you. That concept just seems like, yeah, that's the price of success and I'm willing to pay it. But the fact that there, you're so unlikely to achieve that success and you've already gotten to a point of being super fanatical. Like I gave up school. I, I had the opportunity to go back to school and finish my degree and I was living in my parents' house. So it was like, it was actually plausible for me to do that and I didn't have too many bills that I needed to pay. I could have just 
gone back to school and taken a break from Amway, but I chose not to. I chose to, you know, drive my dinky little cars that I had. I mean, because I've been very blessed with the cars that I've had because I've never had to like, anyway, I, that's a whole trail of thought, but like I've been blessed. I'm not saying that, you know, my cars have been a hardship or anything like that. I've been incredibly blessed with the cars that I've been able to drive. But, you know, my cars were not meant to be driven that much. It was very dangerous for me to drive the cars that I was driving um, down to Chicago and back all the time. I drove in ice, like, like icy rain and all of the, you know, blizzards, snowstorms. I'm up in Wisconsin and driving down to Chicago throughout the winter, you know, I my car couldn't make it on the the night it was like 2000 winter of 2018 i think where it was like the polar ice caps shifted or something and it was like negative 45 degree weather in wisconsin and it was like if you don't have to go out don't because you could potentially die in that kind of weather and my car wouldn't start in that cold of weather. So my upline had other people from Wisconsin who were driving even further down, like even further of a distance, come by to my apartment and pick me up so I could go to the meeting. I mean, we did extreme fanatical things in order to make this work. I donated plasma twice a week for two years to be able to afford the things that I was affording in Amway. So, you know, we all kind of have that dumpster mentality. We all have, which is like a phrase in Amway, I guess, in LTD, the dumpster mentality that you'd be, you'd be willing to dive into a dumpster and collect aluminum cans to succeed. And yeah, we all kind of have that, but how many people are actually up on stage actually able to give those, those stories? Uh, you know, the, the anecdotal stories that you hear in these conferences are just, that's just representative of the, less than 1% of people who actually make it in this business. It's, I, I sound like a broken record, but it's just really phenomenal how much people can buy into this concept that if we just continue to, you know, dive into dumpsters, we'll eventually succeed. And how many people in Amway are currently in a dumpster, metaphorically or possibly physically, <laughs> in a dumpster trying to make it in this business and how many people fail and how many people regret all of the time and energy and relationships that they completely wasted in this business. It's, it's just really sad. $10,000. We didn't quibble. We didn't miss a function. We never missed doing our volume. There was no food in the refrigerator except for formula diapers and some turkey hot dogs. The rest of the cupboard was bare. We didn't care. I didn't care. I was going diamond. I was a fanatic. I was obsessed. And I did not care. I was going diamond. They didn't say what the path was, how easy it was, how simple it was. I was going diamond. And whether Pam was on board or not, she wasn't totally. I was doing it for me. I was doing it for her. I was doing it for Tara. And everybody else that was coming on behind us, I was doing it for my team that I didn't even have yet. I was doing it for my upline. I was doing it for my cross line. And I was doing it for my heavenly father in heaven who I met just three short years earlier than that decision. But I met him in 1981, 1985. I got the worst year of my life. Daughter's diagnosed with spinal meningitis, no stinking health insurance, a borrowed car, total twice, dumpster. It was less than $10,000. Are you kidding me? But you can call me fanatic. You know why? Because in 1991, we qualified Diamond. That was... Okay, we're not going to breeze over that whole, I did it for my father in heaven. What, what, what did you do for your father in heaven? Why? That's so, that is something that's like, for me, hearing that, I was like, oh, no, forget it. I'm, I'm going to react to this audio because this is the kind of stuff that they tout to be, they're such good people. They're such good hearted people. Why did you do it for your father in heaven? So you could you could have a license plate that says no job and, you know, during a work day, speed in front of people and then cut them off and have them look at your license plate so you can rub it in their faces. That's what you were doing for your father in heaven so that you could get financial freedom and basically just get up whenever you want and not work a job, not actually do anything productive with your life except for tell other people that they can have that success if they're willing to dive into dumpsters. <laughs> 
but knowing that not only are you taking their money from LTD and not actually disclosing that half of your income, if not more, is actually from leadership team development and not from Amway itself, but also it, it just it, it it just blows my mind the amount of just virtue signaling, I think that might be what it's called. The fact that it's like, I did it for my father in heaven, where it's like everything that you just listed as to what you're able to do, you're able to write, race dirt bikes, and you're able to, you know, have a big house that you custom designed everything for and, you know, have all the, you know, luxury cars that you want and, Okay, but how is that doing anything for your father in heaven? When did Jesus ever tell you to go and become rich so that you can, you know, be wealthy and rub your wealth in other people's faces? When did Jesus actually say that? In fact, I, I, I'm not trying to get preachy, but let's just dive into this for a second. The fact that it's like Jesus actually encountered rich men in the Bible and said, if you really want to follow me, go and sell all of your wealth and so and then you can come and follow me. Because you have to make a decision. You can't serve two masters. That's a biblical principle. You can't serve both God and money. So where is this coming from? I did it for my father in heaven. God never asked you to accumulate all your wealth and scam hundreds of thousands of people and and waste everybody's lives, waste everybody's time and have them giving up time with their family, putting their health and their lives and their family's lives at risk. How many people are diving in dumpsters? How many people don't have food in their refrigerators except for turkey hot dogs and and formula? How many people are driving cars that should not be driven on the road for however many miles in dangerous conditions in order to achieve a dream that you're touting to people that is possible to everyone and in the meantime, you're, you're proclaiming that you're doing it for your father in heaven. I don't want to be, you know, claim like a prophet or anything like that, but I'm pretty sure God never asked you to do that. God never called you to become wealthy so that you can rub it in other people's faces. God didn't say that. And the fact that that's something that you're preaching from a pulpit or from the, the big stage, th there's going to be accountability for that. For the religious folks who are watching this, there's going to be accountability for that kind of, that kind of deception and just straight up false teachings. It's just ridiculous. It really gets me heated. And that's why I really get upset with a lot of Christians today. And I, this isn't supposed to be a rant, but this is just this whole name it and claim it and manifest and God wants you to achieve all of this and on earth as it is in heaven. And, you know, all of these things, it's, it's just that's not how life works. It's not how life works. A loving God doesn't let children in third world countries starve to death or, you know, doesn't let all of the atrocious things happen in the world just so that you can live up in your mansion up on some hill and you can drive a car saying no job on the license plate and rub it in other people's faces. That's not a loving God. That's not the God I serve. So that's where I draw the line. It really upsets me. Mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> I'm going to cut this off right here, uh, which I don't know where I'm cutting it off because I'm just doing the whole reaction and then filming my other little beginning and ends at the end of the thing. So it's maybe a hot mess. So I'm sorry, but I'm cutting it off here. We're going to return next week with part two of Call Me Fanatical. Okay, bye.